everyone. It's so nice to see everyone out this evening. Um, and welcome to the LBJ Museum. Um, I'm Linda Rodriguez. I'm Vice President of the Board of the LBJ Museum, Board of Directors. We have our presidents here tonight, Wayne Kramer. We have also uh, Ann Burnett, she's back here. We have Kate Clayton, where'd you go, Kate? Ellie Deeds, where's Ellie? And then we have a few people that could not make it on our board, Brian Ray, Claudette Blythe, Carmen Imel, Ed Mahalkinen, Melissa Millicum, and Mark Rockymore. They're also on our board. I, w I brought my little cheat sheet because I didn't want to, we've got a few new members on our board. I didn't want to make, sh I want to make sure I didn't forget anybody. So this is our spring lecture. If you're familiar with the museum, then we have, we have a spring and a fall lecture every year. Um, and we try to pick something fun and or interesting to present to the community. Uh, this evening is both fun and interesting. Oh, <laughs> um, I, uh, I looked at this cookbook and um, you know I think I have about 60 cookbooks. Some of them I got from my mom, some of them I've gotten myself and then just a whole just boxes of family recipes. And uh, this is a cookbook unlike anything that I have. And maybe unlike anything that you might have in your collection. Um, it is like a bird's eye view of our president, Lyndon B. Johnson and Lady Bird while they were at the White House and then entertaining people at the ranch during their term. So um, just such interesting recipes in here, some classic recipes. Um, I did the Texas trash out there and I was telling somebody it's evolved since then because now you can go to any market and buy any kind of variation, garlic flavored, sweet flavored, everything added to it, M&Ms and things like that. But this was the original version and I remember my mom making that also in the late 60s and the 70s. Uh, so it's interesting to see the, the evolution of some of these recipes. And then also the classics that are still remaining that uh, that Lady Bird collected, not only from Central Texas uh, and that she, they brought to the White House, but also some recipes that she collected there from the East Coast, from people that they uh, were meeting there and um, and connecting with up there. So um, what I like about this cookbook is that there are historical uh, tidbits and stories all the way through so it's almost like something you could just read um, as you as you sit and, and, and go through the recipes and and look at this historical data that they have that Jean has presented us with um, and also her artwork all throughout yeah. I love the wildflowers that are uh, painted in there and um, just lovely artwork on every page. So that is something that adds to it. So again, fun and interesting. Um, and all with the unmistakable stamp of Lady Bird and Linda when they were in the White House and again entertaining at the, at the ranch. So please uh, join me in welcoming our author tonight, Jean Schuler. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I have a book, and I've marked a few pages I'm going to kind of go over with you as, as I just speak to, about my book. So I've done several talks, and a lot of people ask me, so I'm just going to start out with this, is why did you make this book? Why did you have, how did you come across the idea? So I was um, a volunteer at the LBJ Library for about I don't know, four or five years. I went every Sunday for most of the day. At the time I was teaching and um, I was interested in food and when I would read about Lady Bird entertaining, you know, I thought, how did she, how did she pull this off? She was at the White House, right, which is DC kind of stuffy, diplomats, people from all over the world coming. Then they would go down to the Texas White House, they called it, along the Pert and Alice in Johnson City, and they she would have hay bales for diplomats to you know sit on and have barbecue, and it was so different. So I 
that was part of my curiosity and then I was curious about you know what did she serve and part of that I think comes from um, and I found this little this kind of sums it up for me I had this interest in food and maybe in a little different way I mean I like to eat don't get me wrong but food it says this food is a means through which people communicate their identities relationships and emotions and I thought that really was what I was thinking when I was trying to connect this DC pretty formal very formal times to entertaining in Johnson City or on the Pertinalis River um, because the definition can just be so different um, at the different locations so I asked uh, when I was volunteering I went into the, the museum store and asked for a recipe book and I was told there wasn't one and I thought well that was kind of weird and I said well do you have anything and the, the one thing they had in the store was a postcard Pertinalis chili <laughs> that was it and I thought, oh, yeah, it's just so weird. So I was talking to an archivist about, um, you know, why there was just such this lapse of how food was presented and how it, you know, communicated with different people. And she said, I don't know, but no, no one's ever written about it. And I said, well, there's, I hear there's 46, no, excuse me, 64 million pieces of paper on the 10th floor of the library. It's on the campus at UT. And I thought, there's got to be some recipes that cooking in there and she said well yeah there is a lot and I said well did they save everything I mean that's a lot of paper and she said yeah pretty much so I said well when I was at 11 I was at the LBJ ranch and we I saw President Johnson and Lady Bird we were I remember out of the car looking at the Longhorn and here comes this cloud of dust and someone said look that's LBJ so everybody turned around and from this cloud of dust was this huge car, and he tipped his hat. <laughs> and I was so beside myself seeing that. And of course, I thought when he tipped his hat, he was looking right at me. So, um, so when I got home, I wrote a letter, and it's it's really short, um, but it says, "Dear Mr. Johnson, my name is Jean Schuler. I live in Austin. I'm 11 years old. I was thrilled Sunday. I saw you in your big green Ford." You are a smart, lucky man. You have beautiful land, Longhorn, a beautiful house. I've even seen your birthplace. And so I sent that to him. And then I got back in the mail this little note and then um, this little engraving of the ranch. So if you're 11, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> so I had saved that all this time. And I said, well, okay, I would like to look at the recipes, but you know, maybe my letter is up there too. And she's like, yeah, it probably is. And she said, when did you write it? And I'm thinking, okay, she's going to find my letter with 64 million pieces of paper. This is going to be interesting. So she disappears for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and she comes back with the, my letter. And she made a copy of it. This is a copy. It says up here, LBJ Library, in that little print you'll see in the book. And then she put the original one back. So at this point, I'm fired up to go up to the research library and see what it's really all about. So anybody here, anybody, anywhere really, can research at the library on UT campus. It's you know, a government property, so we all own it. So you just come up with your topic, and then you ask the director of the library to uh, basically approve it. And then you get a little library card like you would at the regular library and then you go up there on the 10th floor and talk to the archivist and tell her him what you're researching and what's really nice is they they bring you the information they don't let you walk around up there um, in these red boxes if you've been to the library when you go up the stairs those huge windows of those red boxes those are all it's off paper and so I just would go up to the library when I had time and take photos of the recipes or you can use the Xerox machine there. Um, the rules are pretty tight because apparently, gosh at this point it's probably been 20 years, somebody went to the Truman Library and stole a bunch of stuff. And by the time they figured it all out, they had, this guy had sold it on eBay and you know, like, took papers with Truman's name and rolled them up, apparently put them up a sleeve and pulled a shirt, you know, really, really sneaky stuff. So. 
Um, there are you know pretty tight rules, but if there's something that you're interested in, I encourage you to go use that library because it's absolutely an amazing resource and they're super friendly. So as I was going up there when I had time and getting my collection of recipes, I got very sidetracked reading stuff about LBJ and little stories and uh, I didn't realize how, I mean I had heard stories about how he ate everything he saw. Um, and it's pretty true. Um, he was always trying to lose weight, but he was always eating everything too. So I can tell you that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so Zephyr Wright was his personal chef. And she was a cook, a uh, ladybird hired from Marshall, Texas. Um, in the 60s, I would say. S yeah. And Zephyr had a husband named Sammy, and Sammy and Zephyr and Lady Bird would actually drive from Texas to DC. And uh, Lady Bird would report to Lyndon when they made it to DC how horrible it was to try to find a place to spend the night because they pull up in a hotel parking lot. And if you remember in the old days, you kind of pull up and the guy in the hotel could look out and see you through the big glass window and he would see two black people in the car. The lady bird would walk in and say, I'd like two, hotel, two rooms for the night please and she'd be ready to pay for it. And nine times out of ten the guy running the hotel would say, is that a black person in your car? She's like, yes it is. You can't stay here ma'am, sorry. And she would be so upset about it. So she would just uh, get in the car and they'd just take off. And she would tell Lennon then, so that part of when he was doing his, all the civil rights movement, um, he would talk to Zephyr about it and say, I understand how important it is for you to get civil rights passed. Because Lady Bird, she come Bird, Bird told me about what happened. So um, it all just came together so interesting. The uh, Zephyr and then Sammy and then Lady Bird and then going to D.C. and then Zephyr cooking for... Um, the Johnson family in the White House and the recipes were um, she, Lady Bird had two cookbooks uh, same she would save two two recipes of everything she liked one was for the ranch cookbook and one was for the White House oh. cookbook yeah. so what I found in the research library were um, a lot of them were handwritten and kind of scratched through um, I used a typewriter to make it look authentic because her stuff was, most of it was on a typewriter. There's sometimes there are a few ingredients missing, like the Wheaties cookies I told a couple of people. It says add salt, but it doesn't say how much salt. So I just put in half a teaspoon, but you know, <laughs> you, I didn't just want to make up what went in that slot. So if you see something missing, um, that's probably how I found it. So, uh, Let's see, I marked a few pages. Um, oh, a couple, one of the funny things I thought. I was reading about when LBJ was in the Oval Office. He had, he loved Fresca, and he liked Cuddy Sark a lot too. <laughs> but he had a, a button that uh, he would push if he wanted a Fresca. Um, and, and then, um, well, let's see how I write it. Fresca was LBJ's favorite drink. According to historian Doris Kearns Goodwin, he had a special button installed on his desk. When he pressed a military aid would bring in a cold one. Now, when he was in the ranch, uh, he loved um, showing, driving around all his land and showing off his land and his cattle and his longhorn. So he didn't have Fresca then. He had a styrofoam cup that he would put Cuddy Sark in and when he ran out, he would like slam on the brakes and make a big dust cloud and put it in his arm, and that's what the Secret Service knew. One of them better jump out really fast and fill the cup with cutty syrup. <laughs> so he did, and so you know, they, they put, like, he had like two ice cubes. There was something about he only liked a certain amount of ice. Put cutty syrup, you know, put the arm in and then just step on the gas. I mean, <laughs> there is no fooling around. Um, he, on the ranch he had, most of you, have, or a lot of you maybe have been there, um, he had an amphibious car, it floats. So it's, they still have it on the ranch. So he would have these dignitaries, these people that, you know, he was at one point entertaining the White House. 
And he'd say, you know, let's, let me show you my cattle. And they'd be like, oh, okay. So he'd be driving around, and he'd take, take him in his amphibious car, and he'd start heading towards the Pertinalis, and he'd start cranking the brake and cursing. You know, damn thing won't stop. Oh, my, you know, and, and his, these people were like, Aah! And then he'd go right into the water. And apparently a few jumped out. They thought, they thought it's all over. This guy's a nut. I mean, so I mean, he did stuff like that. And I thought, you know, that was worth writing about. Um, so that's where I got kind of sidetracked from recipes to history to funny stories. Because I would read about him at, what, with the food. Like he'd be at a, a banquet or... It didn't matter what it was. He liked sh boiled shrimp. You know, they had these huge bowls of boiled shrimp. He'd just stand there and just stand there. And Lady Bird finally come over and say, okay, it's back three-fourths empty, Lyndon. You know, move on. So he just ate anything and everything that he really wanted. And so there's this one little paragraph that Zephyr wrote him because she was just beside herself trying to cook healthy for him and take sugar out of recipes and um, he like he liked tapioca and she cut out the sugar and it, she was just really at wit's end. So anyway, Zephyr, the Johnson's longtime personal cook, usually cooked what LB wanted. But when it came to his the diet, the president joked that Mrs. Wright was the boss. He didn't accept her dictums without grumbling. However, one evening after complaints that some of his favorite foods were being denied to him, Johnson found this note from Zephyr under his plate. Mr. President, you have been my boss for a number of years and you always tell me you want to lose weight, and yet you never do much to help yourself. Now, I'm going to be your boss for a change. Eat what I put in front of you and don't ask for any more or complain. <laughs> The next night, the Johnsons were hosting a diplomatic reception in a conversation with Senator William Fulbright, who had expressed the fear that we we're succumbing to the arrogance of power. The president denied Fulbright's assertion. And he said, read, a man can hardly have any arrogance of power when he gets a note from his cook, taking it up to him like this. And he pulls Zephyr's note from his pocket and reads it aloud. <laughs> If and when I feel arrogance of power, Zephyr will take me out on it. <laughs> so things like that really sidetrack me a lot from recipes. Um, now, uh, let's see what else I'm marking here. Uh, I'll, I'll find them in the right order. Um, the other thing that people ask me is like, well, what did, what did LBJ do? I was like, well, what did LBJ do? Oh my God, are you kidding? So I have on page 118 the list of what he did. And when I was reading this, I remember in the research room, I thought, okay, how do we have these nuts in the White House that can't do anything when LBJ did all of this in a short amount of time? I mean, people say, if they say anything like, oh, I'll watch Sesame, thank LBJ for that. I mean, it, it starts out 1963, clean air, vocational education, man parent training, 1964, war and poverty, criminal justice, truth and securities, food stamps, housing, wilderness, nursing training, libraries. It just, it's so much he did. And the one thing that I, that I did stop in my tracks, in 1968, gun control. I was like, what? And so I thought, not to get political, but I thought, okay, gun control, that's something we all hear almost every day in the news one way or the other. So think about this. 60 years ago, November 22nd, 1963, Kennedy was shot, assassinated. So the Gun Control Act of 1968 is a U.S. federal law that regulates the firearms industry and firearms ownership. And I was thinking, ownership? I thought anybody could own a gun. So. I just got this off Wikipedia, but it goes on and talks about um, the GCA, the Gun Control Act, was signed into law by President Johnson on October 22nd, 1968, and it's the Title I U.S. Federal Firearms Laws. Okay, so then it goes on, so the bill was initially prompted after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. The President was shot and killed with a rifle purchased 
by mail order from an ad in the magazine American Rifleman. Congressional hearings followed and a ban on mail order gun sales was discussed, but no law was passed until 1968. So I thought, okay, something did happen at one point. Um, but it, it's really interesting and it brings up to the Brady Handgun, Handgun Violence Prevention Act, which was also part of, um, which, which was passed in 1993, which amended the Gun Control Act in 1968. And that, hand, that Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, it said um, it should be unlawful for any person to sell or otherwise dispose of any firearm or ammunition to any person knowing or having a reasonable cause to believe that such person, person excuse me, is under indictment, has been convicted, uh, uh, convicted of a crime punish, punishable by imprisonment for one year, a fugitive, um, unlawful user and addict, addicted to any controlled substance, uh, has been educated as a mental defect or has been committed, and I thought, committed to a mental institution, I thought, oh my God, if LBJ knew this, I mean, there's so many things he passed that I think if he saw where we are today with him, and I've talked to a couple other people that wrote books about LBJ, we all just think it was just so sad that how backwards we've gone in so many ways. Um, if you look at my book and read all this stuff that he passed, and then you see where we are today with a lot of it, it's like, what happened? I mean, what happened? So I'll just leave you with that to think about as to why history is important. Um, if you don't know where you've been, how do you know where you're going? And that's sort of what LBJ had in mind when he built the museum in Austin, because his thing was he wanted it um, with the bark off, was his expression, meaning complete transparency. See exactly what I did, where we've been, so you know where you want to go. So I won't get into politics or anything, but it's just something to think about as far as why history is important. Um, then people ask me, what is your favorite recipe? Well, honestly, I haven't cooked every recipe or baked everything in here. I'm still working on it. Um, I'm my mom's caregiver. She's back there in the wheelchair. She walks, but that, it's too much walking tonight. So, um, But she likes to bake the cookies and stuff in here, and I like to do more of the cooking. But between the two of us, we don't really... <laughs> We don't need that much food in the house, so <laughs> I'm slowly making it my way through through the book. Um, but this sagebrush hamburgers, really good. My mom has made the Wheaties cookies several times. She's the one that reminded me, it doesn't say how much salt. Um, and I was like, just put a little pinch in, Mom. Uh, then some of the other fun things I read about how uh, LBJ liked certain things were served a lot in the White House. Potatoes <laughs> and lobster. <laughs> so, <laughs> one on page 182, okay, it's all lobster, but how, he, how they rename it. So there's lobster thermidor, broil lobster, boucher of lobster, Newburgh, cold baby lobster, lobster Erhart, and, lo, imperial lobster. I mean, it just, it, he named stuff for, like the special guests that were coming. Um, Ferdinand the Bull steak. I mean, <laughs> when the ambassador of Spain was there. I mean, he's really a funny guy. I mean, he's really, really funny. In fact, I talked about my book once. This guy, and I am not have not verified this. He said his uncle worked at the ranch in Johnson City, and LBJ was doing tricks all the time and little little things to throw them off uh, working around the White House. And so when LBJ passed away, they were digging the gravesite. You know, it's under that big oak tree. There's a, LB, there's a Johnson Cemetery. And they hit a pipe. He's like a, tw a nine inch, 12 inch something, a really big pipe, right where his plot was. And they were like, oh my God, we can't, what are we going to do? And so some guy said, well, just keep digging and see where it goes. So they kept digging along the pipe. And it was just, just in the area of LBJ's grave. And so they figured out, that was like his final joke, is when they, his grave was dug, there was a pipe in the way, 
and they just kept digging and figured out it was like, like you know nine feet long or something. <laughs> so that's that's that. Now when he died, uh, he died shortly after he was president. He was at he died at the ranch, and the story I heard was that Lady Bird was gone for the day, and Lyndon was doing some work, and he felt his heart attack come on, and he'd already had one, and he, he knew he wasn't going to live to be old, because his heart disease ran in his family, uh, which is part of the reason, like, with not running again, and the, and the Vietnam War, and he just thought his heart, his health just wasn't going to hold up. So he felt his heart attack coming, in, coming on. He picked up the phone to Secret Service and said, boys, you better come quick. I can feel it coming on. This could be a big one. And they rushed him by the, to the, his room and he was dead. I mean, it was, it was killed him pretty quickly. So, um, uh, okay, so Lady Bird, on the other hand, was not a jokester. She was the kindest, most charming, I just can't say enough things about her. Anything Lyndon did she didn't like, she would just turn, just turn her cheek. I mean, the, yes, Lyndon had several mistresses, girlfriends. Uh, one of them, oh, I always forget her, Glass, Alice Glass, told he was a mistress. She was a mistress for a long time and told Lyndon the left side of his face took better photos than the right side of his face. So when he had his photo taken, they always show his left side. And so apparently Lady Bird knew all this and one time they were having their photo taken together and Lady Bird said, now Lyndon show your left side. It's like, she, she got it, she knew. But she stuck with him and was, uh, she says, an extra pair of eyes and ears for Lyndon. Uh, she was amazing, and then we were talking um, somebody about uh, next Friday. Is that what we decided? Yeah. Is, it's, will be the anniversary of the date Lyndon said he was not going to run for re-election. And Lady Bird and Lyndon, from what I read, discussed that at depth for several days. And she was very sensible. She got a piece of paper and wrote down pros, cons and they sorted it out, but up to the last minute she didn't know if he was going to say he was going to run. But it was a big surprise, as you know, when he said he wasn't going to. Vietnam War, from what I read, he just, he was crushed. He couldn't take the picketing every day, the, hey, hey, how many days have you killed today? Hey, you know, the, how many boys have you killed today? He had two son-in-laws in the war. I mean, as he says, the biggest damn mess, and we can't, can't win, we can't get out. And so that was a big chunk of why he, he didn't run anymore. But what he got um, accomplished, like I said, on that, when I started reading this list, I could not believe it. Um, he, uh, one of the historians said, you can tell a president's success by what he's willing to risk to get, to make the world a better, America a better place or something better. And Lyndon gave it all. He could work on both sides of the aisle. Uh, he had, you know, the, the LBJ treatment where he pulled a senator up, you know, like right in his face. Okay, so we've heard about that. So I have since read about that. And the, the senators or whoever had the Johnson treatment said, what you don't know is that your face is <laughs> covered with spit when it's all said and done. <laughs> I mean, he just, just kept it going. That didn't bother him. There was a HBO movie not that long ago about Lyndon when he would go to the, in the White House, okay, boys, I gotta go to the bathroom, come on, let's go. He just opened the door, sit down on the toilet, and it didn't matter if he, going one, number two, whatever. He, he had the people around taking notes, and he'd be sitting on the toilet still talking. I mean, not much phased him. He was really crude in lots of ways. Um, it's some of the White House, you know, he, he didn't like black tie. He's the one that got the white tie thing going in the White House. Uh, at the, he was really comfortable on his ranch, entertaining. He loved the barbecues. Walter Jitton was his barbecue pit master. Um, and then somebody asked me once one of my talks, what about Mexican food? Okay, well, you know, I had to stop and think about it. Mexican food wasn't a big deal back then. It really wasn't. I mean, if you remember, like, there was ponchos kind of down the way and some of those more institutionalized kind of... But it was not 
it was not a big deal. It was barbecue. And then it was like old school potato salad, coleslaw. Um, people used to write Lady Bird for these recipes. People all over the world heard about these world famous barbecues. He had entertainment, Cactus Pryor from Austin, he had sheepdog training and showed these sheepdog jumping around. And it was really, it was really amazing. But that's why all these stories, that's why I had to sidetrack from just the recipes. It was just too much fun reading about what LBJ would do next. And, uh, like even on Air Force One, he'd eat up people's plate. I mean, apparently the press was on the plane once and he started eating off, uh, it was um, the ambassador of Australia, I think. The wife was sitting next to LBJ, just started, just started eating off the plate. And of course she's like, you know, kind of horrified. And the press got hold of it, apparently wrote a story about it and he just couldn't live it down. Um, same with when the press came and he, he wanted one of his beagles, show off his beagles, so he picked it up by the ears. Remember? Okay, he loved his dogs. He was not doing anything cruel to his dogs. But the press would get hold of these certain little things he'd do, and they just didn't let it loose. So he did, you know, he did get some bad, bad press al along the way. But he was so interesting to read. There's so many books about him. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite book or not, but... There's so much about Lady Bird and, and Lyndon. I think that they just must be, if not the most interesting couple, one, top two or three. Um, but the book was really fun to put together. Um, I'll, I'll let you ask me some questions. Um, I first thought I was going to self-publish it. And I was just doing black and white drawings because I was thinking, okay, this could be expensive. And then I decided, someone said, oh, God, you can get a publisher. So I asked Texas UT Press. And they said, no, we don't do that sort of thing. But they gave me a list of publishers. And so I sent it to A&M Press, TCU Press. And they said, yes. And so then I was like, I'm getting out the colored markers. And so <laughs> I got a little crazy look at some of the colored markers. But um, four colors are really expensive to produce. But since they were doing it, yeah, that's fine. Um, the recipes, I, um, I've, I've had people tell me, like, the most pe the squash casserole, a lot of people have told me that that's really good. So, if you make something, um, I do have an Instagram, LBJ and Ladybird, and it has, it's the book, it's like just the circle of the book, so you can find it, and you can tell me right on that, and then I have a website uh, called LBJ and Ladybird. So, I know I talk a million miles an hour, I just get so excited when I talk about this book, because there's so many fun things about it. And so now when people say, oh, Rach, I, I got your cookbook, I'm, I always think it's not really a cookbook, but I tried really hard to weave, weave some of this history about Lady Bird and LBJ and the humor of it and the recipes kind of all together. Now luckily I had a really good editor that helped me a lot. Um, but it was really fun. I spent like six or seven or eight years on it. I mean I, I taught school for a while. I put it away, pull it out, find some more recipes, get the typewriter out. There's more than once I thought, oh, forget this whole thing. You know, I was like so close to just putting the trash. And I thought, I can't do that. I've worked too hard on it. So finally, I mean, when, when it got published and I got a copy in the mail, I was just really shocked. So the lesson of that, if you start something, don't give it up. If you really want to do it, you will get it done. Just take your time. Because I never thought I would produce any kind of a book at all. So anyway, if I can do it, you can do it. Um, your question? Yes. Please go ahead. Um, so, uh, Lady Bird was such a refined. She lady. was, yes. Uh, and uh, did she ever get a chance to be the one to choose menus either at the ranch or at the White House? And if so, what were some of her favorite dishes for food? She liked Christmas parties a lot. Um, there is a little letter here, in fact, about she liked, they had orphans to the White House for Christmas. And at one point, I think I read there was some Indians. Indians. Um, she liked putting Christmas parties together for kids at the White House at Christmas time. They had um, gingerbread men hanging on the trees. And it was a funny thing I read, she noticed after the, all the kids left, she'd go look at the trees. And undoubtedly, there'd always be a few, like, feet missing or hands missing. 
<laughs> where somebody, some kid nibbled a little bit, and she'd have to write. She wrote, there's one person, one lady that made him, she'd write a letter, you know, can you make more next year? Some of the little gingerbread boys are missing arms and legs. <laughs> um, at the White House, I don't know, I think that this barbecue is pretty standard. I mean, there's, this, there's a letter in here when someone writes her and asks about what do you like for bar to serve the barbecue, and she lists, you know, what we have now, brisket, home-baked bread, beans, coleslaw, peach pie. They were really into the pies, pecan pies, peach pies. She loved her stonewall peaches, and she loved pralines. And yeah. at Christmas time, she would have pralines made up and wrapped individually, and she would give those out. That was a big thing she liked to do. And, and what did she think about all that lobster? I don't know. I don't know. I guess she ate it. It's, it's really everything I read about Lady Bird, though. She didn't seem like she was a lobster gal. Okay. She's really Texas, Texas cooking all the way. Yeah. Grits, homemade bread. Grits. Yeah. I have a recipe for grits in here. She, she, the way she liked them. Did you ever meet them? No, I did not. I heard stories when I was at the library volunteering that she came through in her wheelchair. Um, and she couldn't talk, and she lost her voice at stroke. And she would just wave to people and say, you know, come here and shake their hand or something. I did not, but I have not heard anything but very kind words about her from people. I, I'm intrigued by the story you told about Lady Bird Johnson driving with mm -hmm. and her husband and Sammy from Texas to Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. And I have two questions related to that. First, is it Typical for a president to have a cook. Well, he was a senate. Oh, okay. He was senator, senate when they drove. Okay, but oh, go ahead. Oh, well, even more interesting then that he had a cook that he esteemed so much that he had them come from Texas to Washington mm -hmm. to cook for him. Mm -hmm. I think Lady Bird was kind of behind that. Um, she she was kind of attached to him. Mm -hmm. Well, and the second question is why did she drive? I don't know. I never read why she drove. Um, it seems like she put it out in a plane with him. And she, yeah, but she drove. I mean, there's. I read more than one story where they would they would drive. Well, thank goodness, because apparently it had some impact on his civil rights. Uh, it did. It it definitely did, because Lady Bird would tell him about those driving experiences that were pretty horrid. I was just gonna say uh, that it probably had a lot to do with her. Wanting to uh, you know keep America beautiful and uh, all the things she did had wild cars climbing along the highways. Um, I don't know if she yeah. was afraid of flying, but obviously she really thought that our highways were important. Yeah, yeah, and she hadn't done the Beautification Act yet when she drove, but she did love to look at the land because she grew up. Her mom died when she was like five or six. And she found a lot of solace and healing in, in Karnak, where she was from, walking around the woods and looking at the trees. And um, she kind of self-healed herself from that death. And, and she did love it. And you know, maybe that is when she noticed the highways had, I, I kind of remember the, the junk, the dump. Oh, yeah. Dump. It's like a dump on the side of the road. Old cars and stuff, yeah. And signs. Yeah. Yes. Billboards. Yeah, the billboard, yeah. Yeah, so like the Lady, Lady Bird Wildfire Center is really beautiful. Um, to me, that is as far as like what what she liked to do. She did. She liked doing stuff like that, like clean the highways, um, the Lady Bird Wildfire Center. But really, with food, she was really a lot about Zephyr, her, her cook. Had Zephyr worked for her for a long time? Yes. No, when she was uh, married, she told she had a friend. Like I read the story when I was in the archive. She she knew a friend that was a, uh, maybe he's the president of a, the small school in Marshall, a college, and she said she needed somebody to help with cooking. And I think at the time it was Ann cleaning, but it turned out Zephyr just ended up being the cook. Zephyr. You may have answered this already, but I was wondering, because Spanberg was not from Texas, if there were any deep southern influences in her recipes. Oh, it was Zephyr? No, no, a lady bird. Uh, oh. If she liked foods that were, you know, more traditionally deep south. She did. 
She definitely did. That's like with the peaches, like the Stonewall peaches. Um, and they grew okra and uh, pickled okra and yeah, she definitely had a, a southern thing with food. Which is why, like they had uh, Vernon Redden, the, or Vernon, is that his name? R-E-N-D-O-N, I think so. He was the chef in the wine house. But uh, Jackie's chef and Lady Bird and Lyndon did not speak the same language. <laughs> I mean, there was something in New York Times that <laughs> White House chef fired over what to do with gorgonzola beans or something like that. I mean, it was, they just had real different food vocabulary. Did you ever run on to uh, her being anything about Sue Bowles, who was her private chef? Bellows. Bellows. Mm -mm, not really. Was she at the White House or was she at the ranch? Yeah, both, but I think mostly at the ranch. Okay, there were several um, cooks at the ranch. Okay, so like when, when, when JFK was shot, you know, they were supposed to go to the ranch. From, from Dallas, they were supposed to go to Austin to the municipal auditorium to something and then helicopter to the ranch. And there were several ladies in the kitchen. She might have been one. They were making all these pies, uh, because one of the things I read was one, when the when the staff at the ranch found out that JFK had been shot and everything was just off. The ladies in the kitchen were like, "What are we going to do with all these pies?" That was one of the things. And she might have been there, but uh, maybe she, Zephyr kind of gave her some direction. I don't know. Well, I know, I know Sue. She's talked about Lady Bird a lot. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe she was in Austin when, when Lady Bear was in Austin. Could be. I don't know. I, I really. She might have been because she, yeah, after Linda died and she had her stroke, she lived um, in Westlake, actually, mm -hmm. uh, in Austin. And she probably had a chef then. Because she really couldn't do anything. She, she required a lot of care. Did Linda? She did, did her daughters receive a copy of your book? Um, yes. Um, Nicole Covert lives in Austin, the granddaughter, and she got one and I think she gave it to her mother. And then there's a lady that I know that knows, Catherine Robb, who had one and I think she gave it to Linda Robb. Um, you know, when the Robb's house burnt down in D.C. like two summers ago, three years ago maybe, there wasn't much press about it. It really surprised me because um, the Robs lost everything LBJ mem memorabilia they had in that house. I mean, it burned to the ground. They were lucky to get out alive. And Linda had a lot more injury than was ever reported from the press. A couple people at my book signs have come up, come up and told me this, that Linda had serious smoke inhalation damage in her lungs and was hospitalized for, I think it was six weeks. And Lucy sat by her side every day. I mean, she flew up and did not leave her side till she was well enough to be released from the hospital. But she was, really had lung damage. Uh, two things. Um, the more you talk about Lambert's like, grit, when she, um, when they did that whistle stop tour, mm -hmm. and we kind of hear about, you know, how, how great it was for her to do it, it was really difficult. You talk about it in the book. Yeah, it's in the book. In fact, I love seeing it out there because I have the red and white, the little red and white, oh, here it is, the little red and white awning. It was really difficult. I mean, she was heckled, and uh, I think somebody even threw food on her one stop. But she handled it, once again, super gracefully. She said, I heard your point, now you're going to hear mine. And... Yeah. <laughs> She was really, and I think her, uh, Linda and Lucy did the tour a little bit with her. And, and a lot of people brought them food on the train, and they couldn't. Lady Bird did not eat any of it. She thought maybe someone's going to poison her or something. Because, uh, but there's a lot where the red and white is, is is the whistle stop tour, and that was really interesting. And it's interesting too the the train, the car. Uh, she told Linda exactly how she imagined this, and she found the car. Um, Let's see. Well, Judith Myers talks about it too, how, what, how unbelievable it was. But they found this old car like in a dump, this train car, 
and re refurbished it. Um, okay, so she says, I mentioned to the president one night, and he said, and he said, okay, it's just vital. So he called and we visited and we toured around all the railroad yards and it, was, it just wasn't available. Then the president called me one Sunday, so I think this is um, from Bess Abel, the social secretary. Then the president called me one Sunday and said, you call Bur Buford Ellington, who is now governor of Tennessee, but at that time he was working with one of the, uh, with the railroads, I think LNN. You call Burford and tell him you find that car. So I called Bur Buford, Buford and he said, I never heard of a car like that in this day and age, but we'll see if we can find it. He called me later that night, or maybe it's early Monday, and said, we found one in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia on the junk heap. They're going to put it back, they're, they're going to put it on the back of the train and get it down to Washington for you this afternoon. So she says, we went down to see the train. It's exactly, it was in shambles, but it's exactly what we wanted. Just an empty car with a great big platform on the back. We had a nice architect come down and design us a striped awning on the back. It took one of the calligraphers from the White House down. He drew up on the side of the train how he wanted it painted, red, white, and blue. I got an upholsterer, um, fine silks, let's see, fine, uh, 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 upholsterer to put on fine silks, and we, uh, we, but it was the cheapest red and white blue cotton we could find, and we recovered the seeds, and she, she talks about it. But so many things were like that. I mean, it was like kind of an, an impossible thing, but they pulled it off. So that was, you're right. From the start, from finding the car to the trip was amazing. I mean, it's just amazing it happened. And then I want to know also what you're working on next. Oh. <laughs> so, the edit, my editor does, he said, you know, do you think you can do, because you bring JFK into this, can you do something with them? And I thought, no. Jackie O was, was so classy, and there's so much written about her that. I, I don't want to touch Jackie O. So we talked about famous Texans, and there's some funny stories. It has to have humor in it, like uh, Janis Joplin, her favorite food, so to speak, was Southern Comfort, and she drank and gave away so much, Southern Comfort sent her a full-length lynx coat in the mail. So there's some funny ones like that that I'm kind of leaning towards. So how many recipes would you say during the course of your research did you end up, did you have enough to cherry pick from your book, or did it come down to recipes that were associated with stories that would add to your book? No, every recipe that I found, um, I illustrated, had a page, but it was like a huge, huge stack. So when I gave it to TCU Press, they were like, oh my God, this is more than we thought. So there's probably, I don't know, 50 years, maybe a little, that did not make this book. But I'm hoping that, you know, they were famous Texans, LBJ, so they'll be in the second book. And then there was some stuff, too, about LBJ that was um, kind of some things he did that were kind of, meh, that she took out of the book. I mean, the only thing that uh, is not really clean is there's on the page here, it's, it says, uh, so when John, Jack, JFK Kennedy, uh, asked Lyndon to be the VP, you know, they needed the southern votes. Um, he said yes, but he didn't really want to be number two. But anyway, so when Jack tells Bobby Kennedy that, Bobby says, shit, shit, shit. <laughs> and I did have a shit emoji, but that was taken out. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I hope you're going to stick around for a few more minutes. Yeah, I will stick around. And um, I love this little museum. And so when, when uh, we talked about, when Debbie and I talked about me coming up here, I said, okay, I want you all to sell the books so that you make all the profits. So, you know, a lot of times authors, the way they... I mean, in all honesty, how they make money is they bring the books and sell them and then they make, but I, I think this, this is just such a lovely place and it's LBJ's stomping ground, so I told Debbie, you know, I don't make any money off the books, so the money, if the, the books you buy tonight, the money is going to the museum.
Welcome to the great audience. Thank you very much. And I'll be hanging around a little bit. Uh, if you want to know if I'm a very good caretaker or not, you can ask my mom sitting back there. I called her out here tonight.